Chapter 2, Part 1 of Aircraft and Submarines by Willis J. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. The Earliest Flying Men. Part 1. The conquest of the air has been the dream of mankind for uncounted centuries. As far back as we have historic records, we find stories of the attempts of men to fly. The earliest Greek mythology is full of aeronautical legends, and the disaster which befell Icarus and his wings of wax when exposed to the glare of the midsummer sun in Greece is part of the schoolboy's task in Ovid. We find like traditions in the legendary lore of the Peruvians, the East Indians, the Babylonians, even the savage races of darkest Africa. In the Hebrew scriptures, the chief badge of sanctity conferred on God's angels was wings, and the ability to fly. If we come down to the mythology of more recent times, we find our pious ancestors in New England thoroughly convinced that the witches they flogged and hanged were perfectly able to navigate the air on a broomstick, thus antedating the Wright's experiments with heavier-than-air machines by more than 250 years. It is an interesting fact stimulating to philosophical reflection that in the last decade more has been done toward the conquest of the air than in the twenty centuries preceding it, though during all that period men had been dreaming, planning, and experimenting upon contrivances for flight. Moreover, when success came, or such measure of success as has been won, it came by the application of an entirely novel principle hardly dreamed of before the nineteenth century. Some of the earlier efforts to master gravity and navigate the air are worthy of brief mention, if only to show how persistent were the efforts from the earliest historic ages to accomplish this end. Passing over the legends of the time of mythology, we find that many-sided genius, Leonardo da Vinci, early in the 16th century, not content with being a painter, architect, sculptor, engineer, and designer of forts, offering drawings and specifications of wings which fitted to men he thought would enable them to fly. The sketches are still preserved in a museum at Paris. He modeled his wings on those of a bat and worked them with ropes passing over pulleys, the aviator lying prone face downward, and kicking with both arms and legs with the vigor of a frog. There is, unhappily, no record that the proposition ever advanced beyond the literary stage, certainly none that da Vinci himself thus risked his life. History records no one who kicked his way aloft with the da Vinci device, but the manuscript which the projector left shows that he recognized the modern aviator's maxim, there's safety in altitude. He says, in somewhat confused diction, The bird should, with the aid of the wind, raise itself to a great height, and this will be its safety, because although the revolutions mentioned may happen there, is time for it to recover its equilibrium, provided its various parts are capable of strong resistance, so that they may safely withstand the fury and impetus of the descent. The fallacy that a man could, by the rapid flapping of wings of any sort, overcome the force of gravity persisted up to a very recent day, despite the complete mathematical demonstration by von Helmholtz in 1878 that man could not possibly, by his own muscular exertions, raise his own weight into the air and keep it suspended. Time after time, the flapping wings were resorted to by ambitious aviators with results akin to those attained by Darius Green. One of the earliest was a French locksmith named Besnier, who had four collapsible planes on two rods balanced across his shoulders. These he vigorously moved up and down with his hands and feet, the planes opening like covers of a book as they came down and closing as they came up. Besnier made no attempt to raise himself from the ground, but believed that once launched in the air from an elevation he could maintain himself and glide gradually to earth at a considerable distance. However, experimenting with the same method came to sorry disaster. Among these was an Italian friar whom King James IV of Scotland had made prior of Tongland. Equipped with a pair of large feather wings operated on the Besnier principle, he launched himself from the battlements of Stirling Castle in the presence of King James and his court. But gravity was too much for his apparatus, and turning over and over in mid-air, he finally landed ingloriously on a manure heap at that period of nascent culture a very common feature of the pleasure grounds of a palace 
He had a soul above his fate, however, for he ascribed his fall not to vulgar mechanical causes, but wholly to the fact that he had overlooked the proper dignity of flight by pluming his wings with the feathers of common barnyard fowl instead of with plumes plucked from the wings of eagles. In sharp competition with the aspiring souls who sought to fly with wings, the forerunners of the airplane devotees of today were those who tried to find some direct lifting device for a car which should contain the aviators. Some of their ideas were curiously logical and at the same time comic. There was, for example, a priest, Le Père Gallien of Avignon. He observed that the rarefied air at the summit of the Alps was vastly lighter than that in the valleys below. What then was to hinder carrying up empty sacks of cotton or oiled silk to the mountain tops, opening them to the lighter air of the upper ranges, and sealing them hermetically when filled by it? When brought down into the valleys, they would have lifting power enough to carry tons up to the summits again. The good father's education in physics was not sufficiently advanced to warn him that the effort to drag the balloons down into the valley would exact precisely the force they would exert in lifting any load out of the valley, if indeed they possessed any lifting power whatsoever, which is exceedingly doubtful. Another project which sounded logical enough was based on the irrefutable truth that as air has some weight, to be exact, 14.70 pounds for a column, one inch square, and the height of the Earth's atmosphere, a vacuum must be lighter, as it contains nothing, not even air. Accordingly, in the 17th century, one Francisco Lana, another priest, proposed to build an airship supported by four globes of copper, very thin and light, from which all the air had been pumped. The globes were to be 20 feet in diameter and were estimated to have a lifting force of 2,650 pounds. The weight of the copper shells was put at 1,030 pounds, leaving a margin of possible weight for the car and its contents of 1,620 pounds. It seemed at first glance a perfectly reasonable and logical plan. Unhappily, one factor in the problem had been ignored. The atmospheric pressure on each of the globes would be about 1,800 tons. Something more than a thin copper shell would be needed to resist this crushing force, and an adequate increase in the strength of the shells would so enhance their weight as to destroy their lifting power. To tell at length the stories of attempt and failure of the earliest dabblers in aeronautics would be unprofitable and uninteresting. Not until the 18th century did the experimenters with lighter-than-air devices show any practical results. Not until the 20th century did the advocates of the heavier-than-air machines show the value of their fundamental idea. The former had to discover a gaseous substance actually lighter, and much lighter, than the surrounding atmosphere before they could make headway. The latter were compelled to abandon wholly the effort to imitate the flapping of a bird's wings, and study rather the method by which the bird adjusts the surface of its wings to the wind and soars without apparent effort, before they could show the world any promising results. Nearly every step forward in applied science is accomplished because of the observation by some thoughtful mind of some common phenomenon of nature, and the later application of those observations to some useful purpose. It seems a far cry from an ancient Greek philosopher reposing peacefully in his bath to a modern Zeppelin, but the connection is direct. Every schoolboy knows the story of the sudden dash of Archimedes, stark and dripping from his tub, with the triumphant cry of, Eureka, I have found it. What he had found was the rule which governed the partial flotation of his body in water. Most of us observe it, but the philosophical mind alone inquired, why? Archimedes' answer was this rule, which has become a fundamental of physics. A body plunged into a fluid is subjected by this fluid to a pressure from below to above equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the body. A balloon is plunged in the air, a fluid. If it is filled with air, there is no upward pressure from below. But if it is filled with a gas lighter than air, there is a pressure upward equal to the difference between the weight of that gas and that of an equal quantity of air. Upon that fact rests the whole theory and practice of ballooning. The illustration of James Watt watching the steam rattle the cover of a teapot and from it getting the rudimentary idea of the steam engine is another case in point. 
Sometimes, however, the application of the hints of nature to the needs of man is rather ludicrously indirect. Charles Lamb gravely averred that because an early Chinaman discovered that the flesh of a pet pig, accidentally roasted in the destruction by fire of his owner's house, proved delicious to the palate, the Chinese for years made a practice of burning down their houses to get roast pig with crackling. Early experimenters in aviation observed that birds flapped their wings and flew. Accordingly, they believed that man to fly must have wings and flap them likewise. Not for hundreds of years did they observe that most birds flap their wings only to get headway or altitude, thereafter soaring to great heights and distances merely by adjusting the angle of their wings to the various currents of air they encountered. In a similar way, the earliest experimenters with balloons observed that smoke always ascended. Let us fill a light envelope with smoke, said they, and it will rise into the air bearing a burden with it all of which was true enough, and some of the first balloonists cast upon their fires substances like sulphur and pitch in order to produce a thicker smoke, which they believed had greater lifting power than ordinary hot air. In the race for actual accomplishment, the balloonists, the advocates of lighter-than-air machines, took the lead at first. It is customary and reasonable to discard as fanciful the various devices and theories put forward by the experimenters in the Middle Ages and fix the beginnings of practical aeronautical devices with the invention of hot air balloons by the Montgolfiers of Paris in 1783. The Montgolfier brothers, Joseph and Jacques, were papermakers of Paris. The family had long been famous for its development of the paper trade, and the many ingenious uses to which they put its staple. Just as the tanners of the fabled town in the Middle Ages thought there was nothing like leather with which to build its walls and gates, thereby giving a useful phrase to literature, so the Montgolfiers thought of everything in terms of paper. Sitting by their big open fireplace one night, so runs the story, they noticed the smoke rushing up the chimney. "'Why not fill a big paper bag with smoke and make it lift objects into the air?' cried one. The experiment was tried next day with a small bag and proved a complete success. The neighboring housewife looked in and saw the bag bumping about the ceiling, but rapidly losing its buoyancy as the smoke escaped. "'Why not fasten a pan below the mouth of the bag,' said she, "'and put your fire in that. Its weight will keep the bag upright,' and when it rises will carry the smoke and the pan up with it. Acting upon the hint, the brothers fixed up a small bag which sailed up into the air beyond recapture. After various experiments, a bag of mixed paper and linen 35 feet in diameter was inflated and released. It soared to a height of 6,000 feet and drifted before the wind a mile or more before descending. The ascent took place in Avenay, the home at the time of the Montgolfiers, and as every sort of publicity was given in advance, a huge assemblage, including many officials of high estate, gathered to witness it. A roaring fire was built in a pit over the mouth of which eight men held a great sack, which rolled and beat about before the wind as it filled and took the form of a huge ball. The crowd was unbelieving, and the cynical inclined to scoff at the idea that mere smoke would carry so huge a construction up into the sky. But when the signal was given to cast off, the balloon rose with a swiftness and majesty that at first struck the crowd dumb, then moved it to cheers of amazement and admiration. It went up 6,000 feet, and the Montgolfiers were at once elevated to an almost equal height of fame. The crowd which watched the experiment was wild with enthusiasm. The Montgolfiers elated with the first considerable victory over the force of gravity. They had demonstrated a principle and made their names immortal. What remained was to develop that principle and apply it to practical ends. That development, however, proceeded for something more than a century before anything like a practical airship was constructed. But for the moment, the attack on the forces which had kept the air virgin territory to man was not allowed to lag. In Paris, public subscriptions were opened to defray the cost of a new and greater balloon. By this time, it was known that hydrogen gas, or inflammable air, as it was then called, was lighter than air. 
but its manufacture was then expensive and public aid was needed for the new experiment which would call at the outset for a thousand pounds of iron filings and four hundred ninety eight pounds of sulphuric acid wherewith to manufacture the gas the first experiment had been made in the provinces this one was set for paris and in an era when the french capital was intellectually more alert more eager for novelty more interested in the advancement of physical science and in new inventions than ever in its long history of hospitality to the new idea they began to fill the bag august twenty third seventeen eighty three in the place de victoire but the populace so thronged that square that two days later it was moved half filled to paris's most historic point the champ de mars the transfer was made at midnight through the narrow dark streets of medieval paris eyewitnesses have left descriptions of the scene torchbearers lighted on its way the cortege the central feature of which was the great bag half filled with gas flabby shapeless monstrous mysterious borne along by men clutching at its formless bulk the state had recognized the importance of the new device and cuirassiers in glittering breastplates on horseback and halbardiers in buff leather on foot guarded it in its transit through the sleeping city but paris was not all asleep an escort of the sensation-loving rabble kept pace with the guards the cries of the quarters rose above the tramp of the armed men observers have recorded that the passing cab drivers were so affected by wonder that they clambered down from their boxes and with doffed hats knelt in the highway while the procession passed the ascension which occurred two days later was another moving spectacle in the centre of the great square which has seen so many historic pageants rose the swaying quivering balloon now filled to its full capacity of twenty two thousand feet whether from the art instinct indigenous to the french or some superstitious idea like that which impels the chinese to paint eyes on their junks the balloon was lavishly decorated in water colors with views of rising suns whirling planets and other solar bodies amongst which it was expected to mingle Ranks of soldiers kept the populace at a distance, while within the sacred precincts strolled the king and the ladies and cavaliers of his court, treading all unconsciously on the brink of that red terror soon to engulf the monarchy. The gas in the reeling bag was no more inflammable than the air of Paris in those days, just before the revolution. With a salvo of cannon, the guy ropes were released and the balloon vanished in the clouds. Benjamin Franklin, at the moment representing in France the American colonies, then struggling for liberty, witnessed this ascension. Of what use is a newborn child, he remarked sententiously, as the balloon vanished. Twas a saying worthy of a cautious philosopher. Had Franklin been in Paris in 1914, he would have found the child grown to lusty manhood, a strong factor in the city's defense it is worth noting by the way that so alert was the american mind at that period that when the news of the montgolfier's achievement reached philadelphia it found david rittenhouse and other members of the philosophical society already experimenting with balloons a curious sequel attended the descent of the montgolfier craft which took place in a field fifteen miles from paris Long before the days of newspapers, the peasants had never heard of balloons, and this mysterious object dropping from high heaven into their peaceful carrot patch affrighted them. Some fled, others approached timidly, armed with the normal bucolic weapons, scythes and pitchforks. Attacked with these the fainting monster, which many took for a dragon, responded with loud hisses and emitted a gas of unfamiliar but most pestiferous odor. It suggested brimstone, which to the devout in turn implied the presence of Satan. With guns, flails, and all obtainable weapons, they fell upon the emissary of the evil one, beat him to the ground, crushed out of him the vile-smelling breath of his nostrils, and finally hitched horses to him and dragged him about the fields until torn to tatters and shreds. When the public-spirited Monsieur Charles, who had contributed largely to the cost of this experiment, came in a day or two to seek his balloon, he found nothing but some shreds of cloth, and some lively legends of the prowess of the peasants in demolishing the devil's own dragon. The government, far-sightedly recognizing that there would be more balloons and useful ones, thereupon issued this proclamation for the discouragement of such bucolic valor.
A discovery has been made which the government deems it wise to make known so that alarm may not be occasioned to the people. On calculating the different weights of inflammable and common air, it has been found that a balloon filled with inflammable air will rise toward heaven until it is in equilibrium with the surrounding air, which may not happen.